Did the <clears throat> divines, the people who authored the Westminster Confession of Faith and the later London Baptist Confession of Faith, these were all Calvinists, and they affirmed divine determinism, or so it seems. Um, but according to some of my friends, even, the divines were maybe schizophrenic or they contradicted themselves because in chapter nine, according to these friends that I'll talk about shortly, the divines affirmed that Adam and Eve had libertarian free will. Is that the case? Were the divines behind the London Baptist and Westminster Confessions of Faith uh, inconsistent within their own writing? Do, is their explanation of the kind of freedom Adam and Eve had prior to their fall a sufficient description for libertarian free will? Those are the questions that we'll tackle in today's episode of The Apologetics. This is Chris Date, and welcome to The Apologetics, where every other week I discuss a wide variety of theological issues and show how a properly biblical worldview can help defend the historic Christian faith from its critics. Join me as we think through what we believe and why we believe it, and not something else. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of The Apologetics. My name is Chris Date and just want to say a hearty hello and thanks for joining me to the people that are already speaking up in the chat, including Susan, otherwise known as Slam RN, the um, chat moderator for virtually every theological YouTube stream out there, including mine. Hello also to Jonathan Green in the chat as Mr. Green. It's great to see you. Uh, hi also to Shannon Herring, um, who is somebody that I think is is going to uh, be much more on the non-Calvinist side of some of the issues we'll be talking about today than I am, but it's still great to have you here, Shannon. Thank you. And I'm seeing uh, a Syrian born again in the chat as well. Thank you for tuning in and for everybody else who I've yet to see <laughs> post something in the chat. Thanks for being here. And if you're watching this after the live stream, after it's been archived into my YouTube channel, um, welcome. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I... I'm trying to think if there's any introductory stuff I want to get out of the way, sort of housekeeping, and I don't think so. I've mentioned in repos... Oh, so one thing I can tell you is that the debate that I was going to have with uh, Shabir Ali on whether the New Testament teaches that Jesus is God, that debate is still going to happen. Um, I think it has been scheduled for Tuesday, March 22nd now at 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, you can get the details at my website at chrisdate.info. So if you've been looking forward to that debate, as I have been, um, just hang in there for another month. Uh, a month from tomorrow, I think uh, that debate will happen. Uh, also, just by way of reminder, in a little, in about a month and a half, at the end of March, at the very beginning of April, I will be in Boise, Idaho. I'm going to be um, having a friendly debate slash discussion with Gary Brashears on the nature and duration of hell at Preston Sprinkle's Theology in the Raw conference called Exiles in Babylon. If you go to PrestonSprinkle.com slash conference, you can find all the details. There's both in-person um, registration options as well as online, you know, virtual attendance options. Um, and the, most of the conference speakers will be talking to racial and sexuality issues, uh, but I and Dr. Brashears will be debating the topic of hell. And I just heard today that there's, it's very likely that um, we, this will be not just something that takes place at the conference, but something that continues on for a few months after the conference. So the uh, plan that appears to be being put into place is that Dr. Brashears and I would lead three one a half hour long um, discussion groups once in each of the months April, May, and June to continue the conversation that Dr. Bashirs and I will have had at the conference itself. Um, so I think that's going to be really exciting, and uh, and I would love for you to tune in or attend. So again, go to PrestonSprinkle.com slash conference uh, for more details. You can also just go to ChrisDate.info, and that event is listed right there on my homepage, so you can get the information from there. And then the last thing I'll mention is that... Um, 
actually, there's two more things I want to mention. The next thing I want to mention is that uh, just a couple of days after I speak at Preston Sprinkles Conference, chances are, um, provided that it is the Lord's will, I will be in Houston for their uh, for a Theology on Tap uh, uh, event that the Houston Theology on Tap folks are putting together. Um, so the Houston's Theology on Tap ministry is setting up a an event for um, anybody who wants to attend on the, yes, Darren, um, that is Gary Brashears of Western Seminary. Um, and hi to B. Minch and Jeremy. It's great to have you guys. Um, yeah, so the Houston Theology on Tap people are going to be having an event where it's looking like, and it's not finalized, but it should be within the next 24 hours or so, I will give a 30-minute presentation on the three views of hell. Obviously, I'll tip my hat a little bit to the view that I think is clearly the biblical one. But then after that 30-minute presentation, there'll be a panel discussion I'm a part of um, that uh, with, with other theologians that represent the traditional view, probably not any universalists, but maybe, um, and we'll be fielding audience questions for an hour or so. Um, I don't have details for that event yet, but it will, if it, ha but if I'm a part of it, it'll, well, either way, whether I'm a part of it or not, it's scheduled for Monday, April 4th. See, I'll be speaking at the conference in Boise on Saturday, April 2nd. Uh, and then I will probably fly home and then the next day fly to Houston for this Theology on Tap event. So if that sounds at all interesting to you, if you'd like to meet me in person and you could be near in Houston on Monday, April 4th, um, just keep an eye out on my website, chrisdate.info or on my Facebook page and I'll, um, and I'll, you'll, I'll post there as soon as I know more details and you'll be able to plan for that. So that's all of the housekeeping stuff I've got out of the way, I suppose. Uh, I'll just dive right into the topic today, and I've got uh, some slides ready for you as I've tried to been or I've tried to do lately. So as I've been doing many of my episodes or starting many of my episodes with, I want to define some terms or or sort of map out some of the terrain a little bit for um, visitors to this show that may not be as, you know, theologically savvy, not super familiar with all the terms of the debate and stuff like that, um, or, or, or in, not very familiar with theological terms more broadly, even, even outside of the debate that we're going to be talking about today. So I want to map out some of that terrain for such visitors. If you are uh, already familiar with all of this, just hang in there for a couple of minutes. We'll get out of the basics and into the fun stuff here very shortly. So the uh, content that we're going to be covering today, the topic we're covering today, is, falls under the category within systematic theology known as soteriology. See, systematic theology is the um, is the looking at what all of Scripture, all throughout Scripture, has to say about a particular topic and then systematizing it such that you can say with some degree of confidence that in a vast you know number of texts on a particular topic it says X, some other text could could be read to say not X, but since all the other topics say X, that must be what it means. It's that kind of um, tool. It's a tool for testing competing um, interpretations of individual biblical texts. Uh, so systematic theology has a variety of different categories. There's theology proper, meaning a study about God specifically. There's we've we've talked in previous episodes about eschatology, the study of the end things. We've talked in previous episodes about ecclesiology, the study of the church. Well, today, like we've done in some episodes past, we're going to be talking about the category of systematic theology known as soteriology. And that word soteriology comes from the Greek word soteria, which means salvation in the Greek New Testament. So soteriology then, according to Alan Cairns in Dictionary of Theological Terms, is the doctrine or study of salvation, the branch of systematic theology that deals with the work of Christ and its application to the elect by the Holy Spirit. Now, I should say, I'm beginning to think this definition might even be a little bit insufficient because the work of Christ would often fall, on, fall under Christology, but maybe Christology could be considered a subcategory under soteriology or something like that. But either way, what we're about to talk about today is more soteriology broadly than Christology specifically. So, 
the topic we're discussing today has to do with the the way we are saved, at least loosely. And I talked about this a little bit last uh, in the episode a few episodes ago on Molinism. So um, you might want to go back and watch that if you're left scratching your head after today's episode. Now, in the episode that I did a few episodes ago on Molinism, I introduced the concept of theistic determinism. One of the definitions I offered of theistic determinism is this one offered by John Feinberg in his book, No One Like Him, where he basically, where he says, whatever happens in time stems ultimately from God's control and God's will. His will about what will happen in time consists of everything he decided would take place in time, right? Whatever God decided, Feinberg says, about the course of events and action in our world will occur. Indeed, nothing else could occur apart from what God has foreordained, decreed, predetermined will happen. Now, that's not to say that uh, human beings are merely puppets or robots or something, um, that we have no will and we're just reacting mechanistically to uh, stimuli coming in through our sensory organs the way that a domino might call uh, cause the next domino in a series of dominoes to fall. No, that's it's not like that. Rather, as Feinberg goes on to explain, various factors, according to we theistic determinists, including the agent's character and experiences, as well as the circumstances surrounding the choice, may have produced the desires that she has. She, the agent, has the mental and volitional ability to choose another option. Okay, so it's not that this is just one domino hitting the next, and there was just nothing, there was literally no ability to do otherwise. No, they do have, an agent does have the ability to choose other than what God has ordained, the, the mental and volitional ability or capacity or whatever. However, given the prevailing circumstances and causes, including the agent's character experiences and circumstances, she will choose the option she does, namely the option that God had determined she would exercise. So that's theistic determinism in a nutshell. God predetermines everything that takes place in time. And although creatures have the capacity, mentally and volitionally, to choose other than what God has predetermined that they will do, nevertheless, they will necessarily do exactly what God has predetermined that they will do, given the circumstances in which they find themselves and the way their character has developed and so forth. All right. Now, this episode is not going to be a defense of theistic determinism. I believe in theistic determinism. I've defended it in other contexts. That's not going to be the purpose of today's episode. We'll talk in a moment about what the purpose of today's episode is. Now, typically going hand in hand with a discussion around theistic determinism will be a discussion around what's called compatibilism or compatibilistic free will. So Michael McKenna and D. Justin Coates in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy define compatibilism as the affirmation of the compatibility between moral responsibility on the one hand and determinism on the other. Okay. Uh, Put another way, it's the belief that humans' choices can be predetermined and yet also the people who exercise those choices despite their being predetermined can nevertheless be justly held moral, morally responsible for what they do. And these authors go on to explain that one strand of classical compatibilism says that freedom is nothing more than an agent's ability to do what she wishes whoops, in the absence of impediments that would otherwise stand in her way. All right. Uh, now, I should point out Um, Having just spoken with my friend Braxton Hunter today, that technically somebody can be a compatibilist, but not a determinist. But that's not because they've found some third way between determinism and libertarian free will, which we'll get to in a moment or anything like that. It's because all compatibilism is, strictly speaking, is the belief that a choice can be determined and still be meaningfully considered free. Because the person doing it can be held morally responsible. But somebody could affirm those the compatibility of those two things with actually, without actually believing in those two things, right? So they could believe in um, they they could they could believe that a determined choice could be free, and yet not believe that our choices are determined. So the most accurate and precise way to describe people like me would be to say we are compatibilists 
who are also determinists or we are compatibilist determinists or something like that. All right. Not everybody who claims to be a compatibilist believes that f choices are determined. Um, but most of us do. Most people who self-identify as compatibilists will say they are. So if for short, for the purpose of simplicity, that's what I'm referring to as compatibilism. Not just the belief that determinism and, and free choice are compatible, but that free choices are indeed determined by God. All right. Um, now, some I mentioned that, according to these authors, a classical compatibilist view is that freedom is nothing more than an agent's ability to do what she wishes. But we could flesh that out a little bit more. So Mark Talbot, for example, in Beyond the Bounds, edited by John Piper, says that, in, that compatibilists hold that somebody's choice, for example, to stop and aid a sick homeless woman is free and morally significant, provided it is voluntary and neither physically forced nor psychologically coerced. All right? So it can be determined, but it has to be voluntary, and it has to be not forced or coerced from without. Another author, C. Stephen, C. Stephen Evans in the Pocket Dictionary of Apologetics and Philosophy of Religion, says that according to compatibilists, free will um, is an action or... or uh, a free choice is an action that is caused by the individual's own desires or wishes rather than being coerced by some sort of external power. All right. So again, it's not dominoes falling into dominoes or computer programming causing hardware to act um, in a certain way or anything like that. Um, these are the choices that these people are, the agents are making. They are making choices. And those choices are what they want to do. They're their desires, their wishes. They're not being externally forced or coerced. And there is a sense in which they could have done otherwise. But it's not categorical ability, which I'll explain in a moment. It's, it's, it's a conditional ability. It's uh, the way that uh, C. Stephen Evans puts it here on this quote, is that the person who um, freely gave money to a charity could have refrained from giving the money if that individual had wished to do so, or if the situation had been different. Okay? So it's not a ruling out of alternate possibilities. It's just saying that the alternate possibilities are themselves contingent upon different wishes and different circumstances. All right. So to sum up the discussion thus far, a theistic compatibilist, for simplicity's sake, is somebody who believes, number one, that creatures necessarily choose exactly what God has decreed they will. Number two, that freedom is acting as desired, externally unforced or uncoerced. And thirdly, it involves the conditional ability to do otherwise. That is, if circumstances or desires were different, then they would do otherwise. That's theistic compatibilism in a nutshell. But compatibilism isn't the only view of free will. In fact, it's in Christian circles, at least, the uh, minority view of freedom. The majority view of freedom, at least within Christian circles, um, outside of Christian circles, I think the philosophy inclines toward compatibilism, but at least within Christian philosophy circles, uh, it, the majority view appears to be libertarian freedom. I'm getting ahead of myself. I just wanted to point out that by externally unforced here, I mean that nothing outside the creature is forcing his or her hand being caused to do X or Y. And conditional ability to do otherwise is like saying they have the natural ability you could say the power or the capacity, but they don't have the moral ability. They, they don't have the willingness. Everything within them screams, I want to do X and not Y. All right. <clears throat> this distinction between natural and moral ability is one that Jonathan Edwards offered. But anyway, so, so those three things represent what most Calvinists like me believe as theistic compatibilists, namely that creatures are meaningly free and God has predetermined everything that we will choose to do. All right, now libertarian freedom. So a, a beginning to uh, uh, defining or a start to defining libertarian freedom as opposed to compatibilist freedom is simply to say that libertarian freedom is indetermined, under undetermined freedom. Freedom to make choices that aren't themselves determined. So for example, Stuart Getz in In Search of the Soul 
says that I find myself having the basic belief that I have freedom of the will in the libertarian sense that I am free to make undetermined choices. So at its, ba at its most basic, libertarian freedom is simply the belief that free choices are undetermined by external factors and agents. They could, you could say they're self-determined, right? I am the one determining my own choices, but they're not determined by external factors or agents. That's the first criterion for, de for defining uh, or for identifying a libertarian freedom as opposed to a compatibilist freedom. But there's more that could be said here. So J.P. Moreland, a very well-respected Christian philosopher, says in Raised on the Third Day that when I, what I'm talking about my libertarian freedom is that I can literally choose to act or refrain from choosing. No circumstances exist that are sufficient to determine my choice. My choice is up to me. I act as an agent who is the ultimate originator of my own actions. Now, I accidentally highlighted more on here than I intended to. The main thing I wanted to get here is that last clause. I am the ultimate originator of my own actions. We see that same thing being offered by William Lane Craig, another well-respected Christian philosopher um, in his book On Guard. He says, arguably better than a definition we're about to add, uh, analysis of libertarian freedom sees its essence as the absence of causal determination of a person's choice. There's that, uh, he's saying causal determination, but he just means determination, period. Um, he's just conflating terms, as we talked about back in episode 35. But, uh, so there's that absent, you know, f libertarian freedom is undetermined freedom. But he adds, like Moreland does, that the person's choice is a part, or is not determined by... Um, causal activity that's other than, apart from, the person's own causal activity. So, you know, putting what Moreland and William Lane Craig together, what they have to say together, we can add a second criterion to the list that we've been coming up with. Free choices, according to a libertarian, originate ultimately in the will of the ones making the choice. But there's still more that we could say. Uh, Roger Olson, a well-respected Christian historical theologian who is a uh, proponent of Ar Ar an Arminian view as opposed to Calvinist view, says that according to Molinists, the creature possesses libertarian freedom if that freedom is not uh, is one that's not compatible with determinism. So that's that first criterion we've identified, and is able to do other than it does. All right, what he calls the power of contrary choice. And arguably, this is the most frequently offered criterion for libertarian freedom. William, William Hasker, another well-respected Christian philosopher, says in God on the Problem of Evil that uh, a libertarian freedom is one according to which it is genuinely possible for an agent to decide in any of two or more different ways. And then likewise, Stanley R. Obitz in Evangelical Dictionary of Theology says that libertarian freedom is one according to which no one, not even the agent, can always successfully predict the decision arrived at. Why can't anybody successfully predict the decision arrived at? Because there's this genuine possibility of doing, um, choosing from among competing options. So we add to the list of criteria that we've been um, collecting based on what Obitz and uh, Hasker and Olson have to say that according to libertarians, free agents are those who have the categorical, not just conditional, but categorical ability to do otherwise. The that is the principle of metaphysically alternate uh, alternate possibilities, genuine, truly, absolutely metaphysically uh, possibilities. Right. Um, if you were to rewind time and play and, and watch what unfolds, it genuinely could unfold a different way than it did the first time. So these uh, appear to be. Oh, and, and then remember that when I was explaining that according to compatibilists, we have the conditional ability to do otherwise. I explained that that means we have the natural ability or the power, even if we don't have the moral ability or the willingness, the ability to will the the um, our, our will is capable of, of willing it. Well, the categorical ability affirmed by libertarians is both natural and moral ability. It is within the realm of 
conceivability that somebody, despite having moral deficiencies or whatever, may still will to do the right thing despite them being predisposed against it. All right. So these are the three criteria that appear if you if you look throughout the literature. I I might have missed some, but this set of three criteria seems to be the criteria that define libertarian free will. And I talked to my friend Braxton Hunter on the phone today, the president of Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary, where I teach. And he is a uh, well-known uh, non-Calvinist and libertarian, uh, you know, proponent of libertarian freedom. And I talked with him on the phone through these criteria, and he said that he doesn't personally see um, a need to affirm the third of these three criteria. But he definitely sees the first two as part and parcel of libertarian free will. And he says that probably most libertarians affirm the third as well, which is just to say, I'm not, I, I have Braxton's, a well-known non-Calvinist libertarians, uh, a well-known libertarians uh, approval that this list of three criteria that I've come up with are, uh, are, are the right list. All right. So non-Calvinists, and, and I pointed out earlier that Calvinists like me are typically compatibilists, but non-Calvinists are typically libertarians, by which it, by which is meant that they affirm a creature's choice is truly free, if and only if those choices are undetermined, and that they and they originate in the creature, and at least most libertarians would say that those creatures have the ability, the categorical ability to choose other than what they could what what they did do. All right, so I'm just to reiterate the the episode. The, this episode, as it continues, will not be a defense of either. Uh, will not be a defense of compatibilism or a dis or a rebuttal to libertarianism or anything. Um, this is going to be a much more modestly ambitious, uh, le a much less ambitious episode. What I'm going to try to do is challenge a claim made by some non-Calvinists that the Westminster and London Baptist Confessions of Faith um, inadvertently, perhaps, affirmed that Adam and Eve had libertarian free will before they fell. So we'll get to that in a moment, but first then, let's talk about Westminster and London Baptist. So there's a lot we could say here, but I just want to give a little bit of um, background for people that aren't at all familiar with Westminster or London Baptist. So in 1643, shortly after the start of the English Civil War that I think began in 1642 and lasted until 1651, um, shortly after the beginning of English Civil War, the Parliament in England convened the Westminster Assembly of divines because they were seeking to um uh they were they were hoping the the assembly could help rebuild some um stability within england specifically within the church by agreeing you know coming to some level of unity on uh what the church of england should teach and the Westminster Divines met regularly at, West, I think, at Westminster Abbey, which, by the way, I've been to. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, from 1643 until 1649. So the bulk of their meeting was during this English Civil War. The Encyclopedia Britannica calls the Westminster um, Confession a theological consensus of international Calvinism. So remember, I said earlier, Calvinists are the ones who typically believe in compatibilism, whereas non-Calvinists typically believe in libertarianism. And the Westminster Confession turned out to be a theological consensus of international Calvinism, meaning it reflected not just the Calvinist beliefs of Calvinists in Germany, but also in you know France and in England, etc. However, it affirmed specifically infant baptism, otherwise known as pedo baptism, the topic of another episode, and it reflected uh, it affirmed a Presbyterian polity, uh, a, a Presbyterian form of church government in which local congregations are subject to, um, you know, larger uh, larger groups of authoritative people that exercise a degree of um, authority over individual congregations under them. Okay, so that's the Westminster Confession of Faith, and there's a lot more that I could say there. Um, and I will say a little bit more in a moment, but let's turn now to the London Baptist Confession of Faith. 
So this is a confession that was in enormous to an enormous degree based on the Westminster Confession of Faith. In fact, it um, it is word for word a copy of Westminster Confession to a very large degree. But the primary two areas of differences are in, or the two primary areas of difference have to do with baptism and polity. So whereas the Westminster Confession affirms the appropriateness of baptizing infants, the London Baptist Confession of Faith is a Baptist uh, document. And Baptists don't believe in the appropriateness of baptizing infants. They believe only believers, people who can express a belief in in, uh, in Christ and who can exhibit the fruit, the um, evidence of being saved, should be baptized. And that would be young adults, you know, uh, maybe in the late, you know, I don't know, seven or eight years old, but no younger, something like that. And the other major area of difference is that the London Baptist Confession affirmed a congregationalist kind of polity, one where, I th if I'm not mistaken, and I'm not a, an expert on ecclesiology, but I think that a congregationalist polity is one in which the local congregation is uh, has, uh, it is it is sovereign in and of, in and of itself, in that there's no other um, body of believers who exercise authority over the congregation except for the congregation itself. And it could, I don't know if it is limited to a government where the actual congregation is the one governing it or whether it makes room for a plurality of elders or whatever but the point is it's a congregationalist polity where each congregation is sovereign in itself it's not under a governing body now this was originally drawn up in 1677 so this would have been um what 33 years 34 years after the westminster confession but it wasn't. It was only secretly endorsed at that time um, because of persecution, and it wasn't until the Toleration Act of 1689 that Baptists began publicly endorsing the London Baptist Confession, and that's why it's known as the London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689, is because that's when Baptists began publicly endorsing it. Prior to that, it was in secret. So, in a nutshell, the London Baptist Confession of Faith is to Reformed Baptists, and I count myself a Reformed Baptist, um, it is to Reformed Baptists what the Westminster Confession of Faith is to Presbyterians. So, or at the very least, conservative Presbyterians, right? So, um, conservative evangelical Presbyterians. So, if you know Presbyterians, conservative evangelical Presbyterians, and if you know conservative evangelical Reformed Baptists, they're going to be extremely similar because their confessions of faith are extremely similar with these minor exceptions. Well, minor in one manner of speaking. Now, today... Whether we're talking about the Westminster Confession or the London Baptist Confession, what we're talking about are confessions that are at least intended to be fallible summaries of infallible biblical revelation. In other words, regardless of how it's how it plays out in practice, right? there are certainly going to be some Reformed people who treat either Westminster or London Baptist as if it's practically on par with Scripture. But that's not what they're meant to be. They're meant to be fallible summaries, and it's the biblical revelation that is infallible and which these confessions are intended, rightly or wrongly, or accurately or inaccurately, to summarize. Moreover, the confessions are not they don't suggest that everything in them are essentials of the faith, that they are somehow definitional of Christianity. All right. Rather, both confessions are meant as summaries of both the essentials and many non-essentials of the faith. So not every statement in either confession is created equal, so to speak. Some of them are going to be affirmations of what's essential. And by the way, where they're essential, you're going to find that both confessions agree. But it also they also summarize a great number of non-essentials, including their differences on baptism, including their differences on polity, and their differences on other things too. In fact, in places where they're the same, there will be places where they do so on non-essentials. And for both of those first two reasons, there are many of us who count ourselves reformed, like myself, who affirm most, but not all, of either Westminster or London Baptist. So yeah, I affirm most of London Baptist, and by 
proxied in most of Westminster, but there are some portions that I don't affirm, and that is, as far as I can tell, totally okay. Because again, these are meant as fallible summaries of infallible revelation, and number two, they summarize both the essentials and the non-essentials of the faith. So the question would be, which ones, which statements within the confessions do Reformed who uh, don't affirm all of them, like me, which ones do we not affirm? And they're not the not they're not the essential ones. We affirm the essential uh, statements that are in these fallible summaries, but many of us affirm or do not affirm some of the non-essentials. So it's the Westminster Confession and London Baptist Confession that we're going to be talking about today, and um, it'll we'll probably spend about the same amount of time we've spent thus far, is what I'm guessing, um, because I've spent a lot of time in this sort of you know, preliminary, introductory, prolegomena type stuff. So here's where it's going to get fun. So in 2019, um, we're talking about two and a half years ago, I appeared on my friend and colleague at Trinity, uh, Leighton Flowers' show, which I don't know if it was called this at the time, but I think it might have been called Soteriology 101 even then. If you've heard of Soteriology 101, that's what this show was on, and you can find it on Leighton Flowers' Soteriology 101 YouTube channel to this day. And what had happened was that I think it was just the very day before I had watched a live stream in which Leighton had a guest named J.D. Martin on his show, and throughout that discussion, it, it seemed to me as if Leighton was suggesting that the authors of the Westminster and London Baptist Confessions of Faith believed and said that Adam and Eve had libertarian free will prior to the fall. I want to play a few clips from that discussion for you to set the stage, um, and then I have another clip after that to play from a different thing, and then we'll get into the material proper. So here is how we began that discussion back in 2019. I'm putting my presentation up for you to see that, and I think it's there now. So yep. um, let's begin first by defining what we mean by one libertarian free will, LFW, and compatibilistic free will, which is marked there by CFW. Uh, and these are the definitions that Chris had sent to me earlier. And so in other words, these aren't definitions I've just made up. These are ones that he sent to me um, for our conversation. So, and, I, and I've highlighted it there so that you can kind of see the difference between these two worldviews. So libertarian freedom is defined as freedom to do or do not without one's choice being infallibly determined by factors external to oneself. Now follow that. I know that's maybe hard to follow the first time you read it. So just really let that sink in. In other words, on my view, a choice is free and the agent is held morally responsible if the agent himself has some measure of control over the factors that decisively determine that choice. And on CFW, on compatibilism, Chris's view, he would say that freedom to do or do not and be morally responsible despite one's choice being infallibly determined by factors external to oneself. So in other words, let me break that down. On Chris's view, a choice is free and the agent is morally responsible even if his choices are determined by external factors. So catch that. If it's Even if it's determined by external factors, Chris would say that they are still free and they are still morally responsible for their choices. So if Adam... At least, at least certain external factors. Okay. Well, we can get more into that in the details of it as we go yeah. through this. And so here's here's the bottom line as I see it. And and, and Chris, um, I'll give him equal time after after <laughs> I kind of do this presentation and he can kind of pick this apart as much as he wants and then we can have a discussion over it. Um, here's the bottom line. Morally accountable choices are either determined by factors external to the morally accountable agent or they're not. Um, I guess it's the, that's kind of the, the basics of, as I see it. Either, either morally accountable choices are determined by factors external to the, the moral, morally accountable agent, i.e. God's eternal, unchangeable decree, or they're not. And so I'm saying they're not. Chris is saying they are determined by factors external to the morally accountable agents. So I wanted first to play that for you. I've got, I've got a couple more clips from that discussion, but I wanted to show you that as far back as two and a half years ago, Leighton and I have already identified the, the kinds of criteria that I've laid out to you in three, you know, in those three points. In this discussion um, with Leighton, we've both agreed that libertarian freedom means that you're not 
determined by external factors. Um, you uh, and and uh, well, I mean, I guess <laughs> I guess that's it, right? Uh, there's also the principle of alternative choice, uh, and we didn't talk about that here. There's also the originating in his will. Uh, I mean, that's almost a tautology with the first one, but either way, the point is that. Leighton, back then, two and a half years ago, agreed that the fundamental um, criterion that defines libertarian freedom is the is that one's choices are not determined by external factors. Okay, but we went on. So let me um, play the next clip. This this just continues from where I just left off. Okay, here we go. So that, that's kind of the, the, the issue between us, the differences between our views. But now the question for our discussion is this. Does the Westminster Confession of Faith affirm that the choices of Adam and Eve were determined by external factors or not? Because that would determine whether the, the Westminster divines were supporting the, w, the, the, the libertarian view of free will or the compatibilistic view of free will. And so that's the question, as I understand it, that we're trying to determine whether the Westminster divines, the people who wrote the Westminster Confession, like 121 of them or something like that, gathered up and, and did this over a period of several years where they came up with this confession. And were they, um, in their words, presenting a more libertarian view of freedom of the will or a compatibilistic view of the freedom of the will, meaning do they believe Adam and Eve before the fall were determined by external factors or not? So that was the question that, according to Leighton, um, that he and I were discussing in that episode. Did the authors of Westminster and by proxy London Baptist, did they believe that uh, did they say that adam and eve were their choice to sin was not determined by external factors um now he couched his words a little bit to say well regard to try and imply that he's talking about not just their intentions uh be, but the actual words they used but notice he did there at the end of that clip say in other words did they believe that Adam and Eve had libertarian free will. So I think it's fair to um, to say that there's a, this question could be asked in at least two different ways or, or treated as two different questions. Number one, do, did the divines believe that Adam and Eve had libertarian free will? And number two, are the words they used best understood as expressions of libertarian free will? Those are both worthwhile questions to ask. Now, but, but but here I want to play one more short clip that was already in what we just heard, just to really make clear what the fundamental issue, at least that I as I saw it at the time, was. And so that's the question, as I understand it, that we're trying to determine whether the Westminster divines, the people who wrote the Westminster Confession, do they believe Adam and Eve before the fall were determined by external factors or not? Did the authors of the confession? believe Adam and Eve prior to the fall were determined by external factors or not? That's the question. And I was excited at the end of the stream because I thought we answered that question. Here's how that stream ended. All right. Well, we've come up on our hour mark. And so um, I appreciate this discussion. I think Same we here. were able to unpack um, uh, some of the difference in the way we might understand uh, the Westminster divines and what they meant. Um, I think Chris is probably right in the sense that the Westminster, right. <laughs> the Westminster divines probably didn't intend to say what I would recognizably see as libertarian freedom of the will. So there you have it. As far as I was concerned, I had accomplished what I had set out to do, which was to convince Leighton that no, the authors of the confessions were not affirming that Adam and Eve exercised libertarian free will prior to the fall. And Leighton says, yeah, you're, you're probably right. Now, he goes on to make clear that he thinks that the words that they used are better understood as an expression of libertarian free will. But in the two and a half years since then, 
I have um, continued to hear, yes, Susan, uh, Leighton, I love you, but Susan <laughs> says in the chat, a Leighton Flowers show that went only one hour? Yeah, we, we only went about an hour, and I think that this might have been, might have been before Leighton developed the reputation, deserved or not, uh, for going much longer than one hour. But anyway, so in the two and a half years, roughly, since we had that conversation, um, I have... I had I've I'd heard at times Leighton continued to state what sounded to me like uh, uh, the statement that the divines affirm libertarian free will in chapter nine, as we're going to be discussing momentarily. Um, now I may have misheard him. Um, maybe he was just simply saying that the words they used are better understood as teaching libertarian freedom, even if the authors didn't intend them that way. But that's not what it sounded to me like he has been saying but i've let it go i haven't i don't think i've said anything about it since this discussion but then my only point is to oh, demonstrate that at least points on. one and two of chapter nine of the westminster do in fact give a sufficient affirmation of libertarian free will as he's even defined it with with regard to pre-fallen adam and eve right so i would sorry i got out of my order of my clips a little bit but yeah that he's making the point that Regardless of what the divines intended, the words they used are sufficient to characterize libertarian free will. Now, I didn't, like I said, I didn't give it much thought after that discussion, and maybe it's precisely because of that particular nuance um it seemed to maybe it seemed to me as if he did it seemed to me by the end of that show that Leighton did agree that the authors of the confessions didn't intend to affirm libertarian free will on adam and eve's part prior to the fall um and i still think that since then i've heard him suggest or imply that they did but maybe the reason i just haven't really considered it worth discussing all that much is because the other point that he's trying to make is that the words used are sufficient to um, characterize a libertarian freedom. But I didn't do anything about, I didn't, it's fine, I, I let it be, but then this happened. Um, so this was just uh, 10 days ago, by my math. Um, I'm beginning to wonder if that's right. But anyway, yeah, I think that's right. So about 10, 10 days ago, Tim Stratton, also a friend and also a colleague at Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary, debated James White, a Calvinist like me, and who, although he... I mean, look, Dr. White, for some reason, does not seem willing to use the, 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 the philosophical and theological jargon that everybody in the industry, everybody in the field uses. I don't know why, but I'm going to state tentatively, tentatively that although he doesn't seem to want to use the labels for himself, James White, like me, appears in every way to be both a compatibilist and a determinist. Okay. So they had this debate just uh, 10 days ago. So now, you know, we're two and a half years roughly since Leighton and I had that original conversation. Now, 10 days ago, um, Tim Stratton, my friend and colleague, debates Dr. James White. Sorry, Dr. Tim Stratton. They're both doctors. Um, and Tim says the following. And there's a slight edit in here just to remove some um, unimportant stuff. But listen to what Tim says in his cross-examination with Dr. White. So... Um, I'd like to start with what you uh, described as creaturely freedom, because I want to understand that. So I, I propose that we use uh, chapter 9 of your own confession of faith, uh, the London Baptist Confession. And for the sake of the audience, I know you know it, but let me read the first two points of chapter 9. One, God hath endued the will of man with that natural liberty and power of acting upon choice that is neither forced nor by any necessity of nature determined to do good or evil. And they back that up with Matthew, James, and Deuteronomy. And then point two, man in a state of innocency had freedom and power to will and to do that which was good and well-pleasing to God, but yet was unstable so that he might fall from it, Ecclesiastes and Genesis. So that's exactly what I mean by libertarian freedom. Exactly what I mean. There's no difference. We seem to both affirm the same thing, but call it something else. So you hear, you might imagine, 
that when I heard Dr. Stratton, again, my friend and colleague, just like Leighton is, when I heard him say this, I suddenly remembered that conversation that I'd had with Leighton two and a half years earlier, and it got me thinking, maybe this is a topic worth covering, because no, it is simply untrue simply untrue. I'm not saying that either Dr. Stratton or Dr. Flowers are lying. Of course not. But it's simply matter-of-factly, as I will go on to demonstrate, untrue that chapter 9, statements 1 and 2 of the Westminster and London Baptist Confessions of Faith are um, straightforward expressions. Darren, remind me after I'm done with my presentation about what Dr. Stratton calls EDD, and I'll talk about it briefly. But anyway, it's just untrue that the confessions in chapter 9, statements 1 and 2, use language that is indistinguishable from libertarian free will. It's simply untrue. So let's talk about that. That's what I want to do today. Um, I want to, I keep saying, because I really want to stress, I love... Leighton and Tim dearly. I can't tell you how much of a blessing and an honor and a relief it has been to be a colleague with these gentlemen and others at Trinity, the vast majority of, them, of whom disagree with me strongly on the topic of Calvinism. I'm, I'm one of the only Calvinists among them, it seems. Um, but they have treated me with almost nothing but love and kindness and respect and admiration and and they treat me like peers and I, you know look i will any day um take a relationship with a non-calvinist and a critic of calvinism who loves me than a calvinist who does not so i want to make very clear and i would love to see more of my fellow calvinists befriend Doctors Flowers and Stratton and Hunter and Pritchett and others, because although all of them are um, very opposed to Calvinism and determinism, they at least know how to treat Calvinists like me with love, whereas many of my fellow Calvinists don't only not treat these non-Calvinists with love, they don't even treat me with love. So... Please, as I go on to attempt anyway, to prove that it is that what doctors Flowers and Stratton have said about the liber about the uh, confession of faith and Adam and Eve is, is matter of factly untrue. Even though I'm going to try to attempt to do that, I want to make clear I love them dearly and I intend no ill will toward what they're saying. So, Leighton, Tim, if you watch this. I love you. Please take it with the spirit intended. I know you're not, I know you and I disagree on the topic of Calvinism. And after we go through what I'm about to go through, you might still disagree with me on the confessions. Um, but, it, but I won't, but it's not because you're lying or stubborn or anything like that. I just, I think that you are wrong. That's all. And I'm going to try to do my best to substantiate that claim. So without further ado, let's get into the meat of today's episode. And this is going to be in three parts. The first of the three parts is this. Chapter 9 of Westminster and London Baptist. Is what it says about pre-fall Adam and Eve sufficient to define libertarian free will? Okay, so I've already had the discussion with Leighton on whether the authors intended to communicate libertarian free will. He agrees, yeah, they didn't intend to. But that still leaves open the question, are the words that they used sufficient to define or characterize libertarian free will. And that's what I want to tackle in this first of three parts. Now remember the list of three criteria that Braxton Hunter approved when I talked to him on the phone earlier today. Okay, number one, according to libertarians, free choices are undetermined by external factors and agents. All external factors and agents, they are not determined by such factors and agents. That's this one. Number two, free choices, according to libertarianism, originate ultimately in the will of those who make them. They don't, ultimate, they don't ultimately originate in a still higher will like God's, or a previous will like another person's. They ultimately originate in the will of those who make them. And number three, and this is optional, like I said, Braxton and even um, uh, Jeremy St. Louis or St. Louis in the chat, they both don't affirm this third criterion. 
But Braxton recognizes that probably most libertarians do affirm this third one as well, namely the categorical ability of free agents to do other than they do, meaning the principle of metaphysically alternate alternate possibilities. They, if you were to rewind time and let time unfold again, there's the genuine metaphysical categorical possibility that it will, uh, that will that the agents will do differently than they did the first time round. These are the three criteria, two or three, that are definitional of libertarianism. So for so here's the thing I want to make clear: any expression of freedom will only suffice to characterize libertarian freedom if at least these first two, if not all three of these criteria are expressed. If they aren't, then it simply is matter-of-factly untrue that the words that the divines used suffice as a description of libertarian free will. Because in order to suffice as a characterization of libertarian free will, you've got to have two or all three of these criteria in your expression. Okay? So with that in mind, let's look at chapter 9, statements 1 and 2, the ones that Doctors Flowers and Stratton claim are sufficient to establish libertarian free will. Statement number 1, God hath endued the will of man with that natural liberty, and the London Baptist adds, and power of acting upon choice, that is neither forced nor by any absolute necessity of nature determined to do good or evil. Number 2, Man, in his state of innocency, had freedom and power to will and to do that which is good and well-pleasing to God, but yet mutably, and in place of mutably, London Baptist says, was unstable, so that he might fall from it. Okay? So these are statements one and two of Westminster and London Baptist Confessions of Faith. Now notice, or so here's a question I want to ask. Does this statement say that the first human wills or choices were undetermined? Well, by their own words, they are undetermined only by necessity of nature. I mean, it's right there on the screen. They're neither forced nor by any absolute necessity of nature determined to do good or evil. It doesn't say nor determined to do good or evil. It just says nor determined by any absolute necessity of nature to do good or evil. And determined is not synonymous with forced as much as some libertarians like to pretend they are. There is, there is no denial here of determination by other factors, external or otherwise. So, nope. The divines did not say that the first human wills were undetermined. We'll say more about that shortly. Second question, do, does this chapter and its statements 1 and 2 say that the choices of Adam and Eve prior to the fall originated ultimately in themselves? Read it as many times as you like and you will find that no. They do not deny that... Um, that their choice ultimately originated in God's will. In fact, as we'll see shortly, it's the exact opposite. So, nope. Their choices are not said to have originated ultimately in themselves. This isn't looking good, is it? For the claim that the statement here in the Confessions is sufficient to establish or, or characterize libertarian free will. But what about the claim that libertarians make that uh, a free choice is one uh, which, uh, which one made by an agent who had the categorical ability to do otherwise. Did the divine say that? Read it as many times as you like, and you will find that no, the divines do not here affirm the categorical ability to do otherwise. This is not there. Understanding the distinction between categorical and conditional ability. Yes, they affirmed they had the conditional ability. It says they weren't forced. They weren't determined by any absolute necessity of nature. So they had the conditional ability. Had they wanted to do other than they did, they could have done so. But it doesn't say that they genuinely or metaphysically could have done so. So, nope. 
the divines did not say that prior to the fall, Adam and Eve had the categorical ability to do other than they did. All three criteria, at least two of which are necessary for, for characterizing free, libertarian free will as distinct from other forms of free will, like compatibilism, all three of them are missing from what the divines said. The simple... Matter of fact, as much as I respect and love and admire doctors Flowers and Stratton, as much as they want to claim that the description there in chapter 9, statements 1 and 2 of Westminster and London Baptist are sufficient to characterize libertarian free will, they are not. Matter of factly, they are not. The conditions affirmed in, chapters, in chapter 9, statements 1 to 2 of both confessions might be necessary conditions for libertarian freedom, but they are not sufficient. In fact, they're not only not sufficient to characterize libertarian free will or to dis distinguish it from compatibilist free will, they're also not sufficient for distinguishing compatibilist freedom from libertarian freedom. In other words, statements one and two of chapter nine are what philosophers would say are undeterminative <laughs> um, or, or underdeterminative. They are not sufficient to establish either libertarianism or compatibilism. Both libertarians and compatibilists can affirm what the divines say in statements one and two of chapter nine of both confessions, which means, again, matter-of-factly, that it is not a sufficient characterization, or I should say it's not sufficient to be a characterization of libertarian freedom. It's just not. But that brings us to part two. So I've established, I think, that no, the statements one and two of chapter nine are in and of themselves insufficient to characterize either libertarian free will or compatibilist free will on the part of Adam and Eve prior to the fall. But I think that we can look at what the rest of chapter nine says to start to give us an indication as to which kind of freedom the authors had in mind. And so in this second part of this threefold treatment of these confessions, I want to ask, from what exactly do these statements in chapter 9 say Adam and Eve were free prior to the fall? Because what a libertarian wants to say is that free agents are free from all determinative factors outside of themselves. But... Is that the kind of freedom that the authors of the, the, the divines, the authors of these confessions, are saying Adam and Eve were free from? Or the kind of freedom they exercised? Well, firstly, just look at the language they use. They use the language of forced. They use the language of necessity of nature. Um, it says that their, their nature didn't determine them to do either good or evil. They had the freedom and power to do that which is good. You see, what's clear all throughout these statements is that they affirm the original freedom of Adam and Eve from coercion and from a determinative sinful nature. That's what they're affirming. Then, statement three of the same chapter, so following right on the heels of the first two statements, man, by his fall into a state of sin, hath wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So as, a, so as a natural man, being altogether averse from that good, another way to put that would be altogether opposed to that good, and dead in sin, is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself unto, thereunto. So what statement three is affirming is humanity's determinative sinful nature after the fall. So the thing that statements one and two are saying Adam and Eve were free from, namely coercion, or in particular here relevant to this, freedom from a determinative sinful nature, statement three then says is that which they, after the fall and all of their progeny, suffer from. Namely, a sinful nature that does determine their actions. And then statement four following on the heels of statements one through three, says that when God converts a sinner and translates him into the state of grace, he frees him from his natural bondage under sin. And by God's grace alone, enables him freely to will and to do that which is spiritually good. And then it goes on. 
You see, statement four affirms the partial undoing of that determinative sinful nature after the fall. Look at it again. I, I, should have, I should have read on. He still has corruption, the agent does, so he doesn't do spiritually good perfectly or only, but he also does that which is evil. So it's a partial undoing. But you see the logical, the, the flow of thought here, right? Statements one and two are meant to say, more than anything else, that Adam and Eve didn't have a sinful nature that determined them to do evil. Statement three says that after the fall, they did, and so did their progeny. And then statement four says that the elect upon salvation experience a partial undoing of that so that they no longer suffer only from a sinful nature that predetermines them to do evil, but they also have a, 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 a new man, a new nature that determines them to sometimes do good. You see, chapter or statements one through four, not just one and two, but one through four of this chapter are clearly meant to affirm that pre-fall humanity was neither externally coerced or forced, nor determined by a sinful nature to do evil. There's nothing whatsoever in this chapter that suggests libertarian free will over and above a compatibilist free will. Nothing. Matter of factly, nothing. And all the evidence in statements three and four, which are clearly meant to be part of the story told by chapter nine, make it clear that seemingly, or, or at least incline statements one and two toward a compatibilist reading, because what they're saying, it's all about what our nature and our character either determines us or does not determine us to do. Which is a compatibilist way of talking about libertarian, or a compatibilist way of talking about freedom more than a libertarian one. So in part one, we've established that there's the, the statements one and two of chapter nine are not a sufficient descript are not do not suffice to distinguish libertarian freedom from capitalist freedom, or the reverse. And then in part two, I showed that the whole context of chapter nine makes clear that the kind of freedom they're talking about is freedom from a nature of oneself that determines one to do good or evil. And then, uh, and then the failure, the, the lack of that freedom after the fall, and then the partial restoration of that freedom after the uh, after salvation. So, in this part two, I think what I've established is that, um, in its larger context of chapter nine, the freedom about which they speak in statements one and two is most likely to be a compatibilist freedom rather than a libertarian one. But in this third part, I'm going to put the final nail in the coffin. The uh, final nail in the coffin. Because what I'm going to argue here is that chapters 3, 5, and 6, which all precede chapter 9, constitute the surrounding context which proves that the divine's intended compatibilist freedom rather than libertarian freedom in chapter 9. So let me establish that. In chapter 3, statement, statement 1, the divines say that God from all eternity not after the fall, but from all eternity past, did by the most wise and holy, holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. Not whatsoever comes to pass after the fall, but whatsoever comes to pass, period. Yet so as thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will. And then statement two says that although God knows whatever may or can come to pass upon all supposed conditions, yet hath he not decreed anything because he foresaw it as future or as that which would come to pass upon such conditions. This is a this is a denial of both um, an Arminian view of predetermine or pre predestination according to which what God decrees is what he foresees people will do. And it's also a rebuttal of Molinism, according to which God decrees that which he foresees would be done by agents in a possible world. It's denying both of those. So what chapter 3 affirms, straightforwardly, is exhaustive divine determinism, plus the creature's moral responsibility. By the way, that's textbook compatibilism. Determinism plus moral responsibility. Chapter 5, Statement 1. The almighty power, unsearchable wisdom, and infinite goodness of God so far manifest themselves in his providence that it extends even to the first fall. And all other sins of angels and men. And not by a bare permission, but such as hath joined with it a most wise and powerful bounding 
Yet, so as the sinfulness thereof proceedeth only from the creature, and not from God. So chapter 5 affirms, just like chapter 3 did, divine determinism, but here specifically of the first sins, and human moral responsibility. Guess what? That's textbook compatibilism. <laughs> I don't know if that whisper came through as I, as I meant it to, but hopefully it did. So that's chapters 3 and 5, but what about chapter 6? Statement 1. Our first parents, being seduced by the subtility and temptation of Satan, sinned in eating the forbidden fruit. This their sin God was pleased to permit, having purposed to order it in his own glory. But remember what we just saw. It's not by a bare permission, but a permission that is joined with God's wise and powerful bounding, right? So yes, he's pleased to permit it, but it's a permission that involves a powerful binding that prevents them, uh, or, or that, uh, that's not the right word, that determines that they will do what they do. And the reason he does that kind of not bare permission, but permission plus determination, he does in order to bring about, to, to magnify his own glory. He does it with the purpose of his own glory in mind. Again, with powerful bounding, not just a bare permission. So chapter 6 implies divine determinism of the first sins. Again, chapter 3 and chapter 5 both affirm divine determinism. In particular, chapter 5 is uh, says a determinism of the first sins. And both chapters affirm human moral responsibility. That's textbook compatibilism. And then chapter 6, although it uses the language of permission, to describe God's permission of the first sin, nevertheless, is in the context of saying it's not a bare permission, and says that he does so in order to, with, with the purpose of his own glory in mind. So chapters 3, 5, and 6 clearly and collectively affirm that Adam and Eve's sin was divinely predetermined, and they were morally responsible. That is textbook compatibilism, not libertarian freedom. And it's only after these chapters that we get to chapter 9. So, here's just a, sum, a summary of how we know that chapter 9 of Westminster and London Baptist affirm compatibilist freedom rather than libertarian freedom. Number one, the description of pre-fall freedom in chapter 9, statements 1 and 2, is insufficient to characterize libertarianism. Or to put it another way, it's insufficient to distinguish libertarianism from compatibilism. Why? Because all three of those criteria, um, the fact that they're not determined by external factors, uh, the fact that they are, um, the, 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 the choices originate in the free agent, and the fact that um, free agents are those who have the categorical, uh, categorical, categorical ability to do other than they do, not one of those three criteria are there. None of them. So the very criteria that libertarian scholars, theologians, exegetes, etc., um, of offer as definitional of libertarian freedom, all of those criteria are missing from, from London Baptist and Westminster. So chapter 9, statements 1 to 2 are insufficient to characterize libertarianism. Number 2, chapter 9, the rest of chapter 9, says that the first humans weren't externally forced or internally inclined toward evil. In other words, it's all about a freedom from bondage to the will, a sinful, a sinful nature that binds us to do evil. That in and of itself begins to suggest that the kind of freedom mentioned in statements one and two are characteristic of compatibilist freedom rather than libertarian freedom. But what puts the final nail on the coffin are chapters three through six, because they clearly and unequivocally affirm determinism and moral responsibility of Adam and Eve in their very first sin. And that combination of determinism and human responsibility are textbook compatibilism. And it's on the heels of that textbook compatibilism that the divines then go on to characterize Adam and Eve as having been free from a, a determinative sinful nature. This is all about compatibilism. There simply is no basis whatsoever 
There's just not, Tim, and there's just not, Leighton. No basis whatsoever for arguing that the divines believed Adam and Eve had libertarian freedom or that the language they used in statements 1 and 2 of chapter 9 are sufficient for defining libertarian freedom. No basis at all, period. That's the matter of fact. That's where we're at. Now, does that mean that it is logically coherent to affirm the kind of freedom that the divines affirm Adam and Eve had in chapter 9, statements 1 and 2. No, they could be logically incoherent and the authors just didn't know it. That's certainly possible. And I'm not arguing otherwise here. I will in other contexts, but not in this episode. And it's not to say that... Um, well, I don't know what else. I don't know what else there is to say. If if Leighton and Tim, if you guys want to argue that the characterization of freedom that the that the divines offer in chapter nine verses one and two, if you want to argue that that is more consistent with libertarianism than with compatibilism, because compatibilism isn't logically coherent, well, then you could do so. But what you simply cannot argue at least not with any standing, with any basis, is that the language they used is sufficient in and of itself to characterize libertarian freedom. Because it's not. Your own scholars make that clear by listing those three criteria as definitional of libertarianism. Number one, no, ex no not determined by external forces or factors. Number two, the choice originates ultimately in the will of the agent. And number three, agents have the categorical ability to do otherwise. Not one of those three things is in uh, chapter nine verses one and two of those confessions. So it's simply a matter of fact that's insufficient. And then for the other reasons that I offered, it becomes really clear that the authors were expressing what they thought to be compatibilist free will using language that we might say is insufficient to distinguish one view of freedom for the other. But of course, they weren't writing statements one and two in a vacuum. They were writing those statements in a larger context that included their affirmation of determinism and its compatibility with human freedom. So that's the conclusion of my presentation. I hope that it is helpful. Now, I know that Darren, I think it was, asked me earlier, um, what are my thoughts on the definition of EDD? So let me explain here. Um, I could probably pull this up without too much time. Just give me one second to see if I can get this on the screen fast enough. So at, let's see here. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the uh, video of their debate because there was a slide in which Stratton uh, purports to, to, to define exhaustive divine determinism. I'm having, a tr I'm having trouble finding, hold on, let me look in the transcript really quick. Um, exhaustive. Um, well, that doesn't look quite right. I want to be able to. Sh I want to be able to speak to um, what Stratton actually defines as exhaustive divine determinism. But the slide that I thought he had is not the thought that he had. So let me instead. I'll, I'll just share this with you. Um, Gosh, what's going to be the best way to do this? Uh, <laughs> I didn't prepare for this, man. Okay, here we go. This I should be able to. Okay, I'll just read it for you. Okay, sorry. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to try to figure out the best way to share this on the screen. If you go to 13 minutes and 8 seconds in the um, debate video put forward by, published by the venue, First Lutheran Houston, you'll see that... Um, Tim Stratton defines determinism as the idea that antecedent conditions are causally sufficient for an effect, a.k.a. causal determinism. And I thought he had a slide up on there. Maybe he did, and I'm just not finding it off the cuff. But I, had a, I think he had, might have 
argued that exhaustive divine determinism is the belief that God thusly d causally determines everything that takes place in time. So to answer your question, Darren, what do I think about his definition of exhaustive divine determinism? Well, if you go back to episode 35 of this show where I talk about Molinism, you'll get the answer to that question. Because basically what I argue is that no, um, Calvinists and, deter and, and theistic determinists and compatibilists are not committed to causal determinism. This is a canard, I think, um, because although there may be some Calvinists who affirm a causal determinism, indeed, I quoted John Feinberg earlier who is comfortable using the phrase causal determinism to characterize his view. Uh, number one, many of us Calvinists don't comfortably affirm that language. And number two, that phrase, causal determinism, already has a meaning in the philosophical literature. Causal determinism in the physical in, in the uh, philosophical literature refers specifically to what might be called scientific or materialistic determinism, whereby from the moment of the Big Bang, uh, the laws of physics and uh, whatever quantum you know randomness uh, happens, those things are all that are in play. And when a, when a human being makes a choice, all that's happening is the illusion of a choice. What's happening is that. Um, the laws of physics beginning from the moment of the Big Bang, it's just like a, a chain of cause and effect all throughout time until they reach the point where something happens in the circumstances facing an agent. What happens reaches the agent through his or her sensory organs, and those cause neurons to fire in certain ways, and those neurons fire in such a way that seems like choice, but is just like one domino falling after the previous domino hit it. All right. That's what causal determinism refers to. A theistic determinist isn't committed to that, uh, to that notion. They can, they could say that the means by which God has chosen to determine all events that take place in time is through causal determinism of that sort. Um, but a Calvinist and a theistic determinist or a compatibilist needn't affirm, needn't, does not, isn't, doesn't have to be committed to that. So number one, the phrase causal determinism is misleading for my view because it's, um, it's already got something in the, it already refers to something in the literature. And number two, I encourage, um, in that episode 35, a few episodes ago, I encourage even those few fellow Calvinists who are comfortable calling themselves causal determinists to not do so. And the reason is because it is misleading in its equivocation. You see, when somebody like Tim Stratton puts a, puts a slide up on the screen and says that um, according to determinism, antecedent conditions are causally sufficient for an effect... The kinds of causes that, that he has in mind are the kinds of causes illustrated or exhibited in Domino's Robots and Puppets, right? When a puppeteer pulls a string attached to the puppet's limbs, it causes the limb to move. When a domino falls into the next domino in a series, it causes the domino to fall. When a, when, when a computer programmer's code executes on the hardware, it then causes uh, the limbs of a robot to move or whatever, right? That kind of causation, simple mechanistic causation, is what non-Calvinists or critics of Calvinists have in mind when they refer to our form of determinism as causal determinism. That's what they're objecting to, that kind of causation. And I think they're right to object to that kind of causation because if we are nothing more than puppets, dominoes, or robots, then I don't know how you could hold us morally, how God could hold us morally responsible. I think that's legitimate. But the problem is the very fact that they use the analogies of puppets, robots, and um, puppets, robots, and and uh, computer programs, avatars, etc., the, the uh, dominoes. The reason they use those ex those analogies in their objections shows that the kind of causation they have in mind is that kind of causation. But what Calvinists who are comfortable affirming uh, so-called causal determinism mean is not that kind of causation. They're not saying that a human agent is mechanistically being caused to do what it does, like a domino hitting the next domino and it just... It just plays out right it's just it's just laws of physics no we're all what we're saying we theistic determinists is that 
God has so arranged time such that by the time you as a free agent face a choice, you have a character that has been shaped. A character that has been shaped by thousands or more years of um, of uh, world history. A character that has been shaped by God's action in that history and by God's actions in your own life. A character that has been shaped by your um, genetics and your prenatal development and your um, uh, your childhood experiences and your adult experiences and so on and so forth, such that by the time you're faced with a choice, the sense in which you cannot do other than what you do is the same sense in which I might be, uh, I might say if told I have, I, I, imagine somebody puts a gun in my head, a hand, makes it clear it's loaded and says, point this gun at your child and shoot him. I might say in response to that, I can't. But what do I mean by that? I don't mean I have I don't have the capacity to do it. It doesn't mean that I'm being hit like uh, that that I'm being caused like one in so many of a series of dominoes or caused like a puppet at the end of strings attached to a puppeteer's fingers or a robot that is being driven by the programming of its computer programmer. I'm not saying that, that those aren't the senses in which I am being prevented from doing something. It's that my character is such that I cannot possibly do that. It would violate everything within me, everything within my conscience. I simply cannot do it. But it's a different kind of causation. It's a different kind of ability. So that's why I don't like the phrase causal determinism, and I won't grant to any of my debate opponents, any interlocutor, that that's what I believe, because I don't. Because I think that it's important that we distinguish the kinds of causes that we normally think of as causes that feature in the analogies critics of Calvinism offer, we need to distinguish that kind of causation from the kind of causation that we theistic determinists are talking about, which is far more complex than that and involves the will, the volition of free agents. Yes, it is necessary that they do what God has preordained, but it's because by the time the choice presents itself to them, they are they have a certain kind of nature, a certain kind of character, a certain kind of predisposition, and they have all these experiences and all uh, genetics and all these kinds of things that decisively incline their will one way or the other. But it's not the same kind of causation, and so to call it causal determinism is to equivocate and thereby mislead. So... And by the way, I, I had a talk with Tim Stratton on the phone before his debate with Dr. White, and I explained to him that, no, we don't affirm causal determinism. And he said, well, you might not, but Dr. White does. But guess what happened in the debate? Dr. White repeatedly said, no, I don't believe it. That's not what I believe. Now, he tried to skirt around the philosophical concepts and language, which I think was really unhelpful. The whole debate proved to be a dog's breakfast as far as I'm concerned. I'm just being honest. I love Tim. I respect James. Um, and I respect him. Uh, and, and I think that it could have been a very great debate. But unfortunately, Tim repeatedly mischaracterized his opponent. And, uh, and, and because it was his first debate, slipped up in some debate etiquette and James does everything he possibly can to avoid discussing philosophical terms and, and jargon and so as a result of those two problems the whole debate as far as I'm concerned is practically useless and that's sad it could have it could have been avoided if number one Dr. White would have um, been willing to engage at the philosophical level because it's important and number two, if Tim had not mischaracterized his opponent's view so frequently. But unfortunately, they both did those things. And although Dr. White was un, um, unwilling to uh, use the language and interact with the concepts that need to be interacted with and used in the debate, uh, nevertheless, it was clear that no, he does not think that God makes causes or forces anybody to sin. He would not, he, he does not believe in something called causal determinism, just like I don't. So I hope that answers your question, Darren. I, in short, I think that um, Tim's definition of exhaustive divine determinism is um, deficient because it conflates theistic determinism with causal determinism, and those aren't the same thing. And moreover, it 
mischaracterizes, it misrepresents the, his debate opponent, James White, and it mischaracterizes, mischaracterizes my view. So hopefully that helps. Now, I'm noticing a, a chat a statement in the chat by B. Minch. There are two levels of determinism at play in a computer program. The program determines the behavior of the computer, but that in no way contradicts the idea that the behavior of all the transistors in the computer are determined by the laws of physics. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what you're trying to get at there, B. Minch. Um, my whole point is that there's more than the laws of physics at play in human choices. Causal determinism, look it up, Stanford Encyclopedia, go back and watch what I said in episode 35. Causal determinism is the view that, that laws of nature, laws of physics, determine your choices. And that's not what theistic determinists like me are committed to. So, hopefully that helps. Anyway, I just want to reiterate now at the very end of my show, in the event that my friends Tim and Leighton watch this, or for that matter, Braxton and Jonathan and others, um, I mean no ill will, and I love you guys, and, and I am so happy to be able to count you guys as friends and colleagues, and, and I am absolutely committed to striving to uphold that kind of relationship between us, because I think it's exactly the kind of relationship that um, Calvinists and non-Calvinists should be striving for. I mean, just yesterday, I borderline swore on Facebook because um, Calvinists and non-Calvinists so often treat each other like absolute garbage under the guise of, oh, it's just lighthearted jabbing. No, it's not. You're shameful. Not not Leighton and Tim, etc., but the people that are treating Calvinists, non-Calvinists, treating each other like garbage. It's shameful. I don't care if you think it's funny. It's not just lighthearted ribbing. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. The point is, just yesterday, I, sw I almost swore on Facebook about how f upset I am at how terribly Calvinists and non-Calvinists treat each other. And I find in people like Braxton, jo Jonathan, Tim, and Leighton, a love and a respect for non-Calvinists that I often don't see Calvinists show toward non-Calvinists. So I love you guys. Um, and I mean no disrespect by what I've said today. But I do think you need to let this canard go. You have no basis whatsoever for claiming that <laughs> Westminster Confession and London Baptist Confession, Chapter 9, Statements 1 and 2, suffic are sufficient to distinguish libertarian freedom from from compatibilist freedom you can't so stop doing it all right stop doing it you can certainly claim in in discussions with calvinists like me that we might want to say uh that our that determinism is compatible with that kind of freedom characterized there um but but we're being logically inconsistent in doing so you could do that fine but stop pretending on your YouTube shows and in your debates with your interlocutors. Stop pretending that what the, 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 the definition offered by the divines of freedom that Adam and Eve exercised before the fall is, is a sufficient characterization of libertarian freedom. It's simply not. It lacks all three of the criteria that would be necessary to establish it as such. And meanwhile, it appears in a context that clearly inclines it toward compatibilist rather than libertarian freedom. So I love you guys, but you're wrong, and I'll look forward to seeing either your attempt to rebut what I've just done today, uh, or I'll look forward to seeing you no longer um, offer this canard that you guys have been offering. So anyway, that's, that's it for today's episode. I'll be back in two weeks' time on Monday. March 7th at the usual time, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Not sure what I'll do then. Maybe I'll discuss other issues that came up in the debate between Tim Stratton and James White. I don't know. We'll see. But whether it's that topic or some other one, I hope I'll see you then. And until the ne next time, God bless and um, be careful out there. Bye-bye. I've been your host, Chris Date. And thanks so much for watching The Apologetics, where we think together through what we believe, why we believe it, and not something else. If you've enjoyed this episode, please click the thumbs up, like icon, the subscribe button, and the bell icon to receive notifications when new videos are streamed or uploaded. Either way, come back in two weeks for the next episode of The Apologetics, streaming live on YouTube every other Monday at 6 p.m. Pacific. Until then...